All right, welcome back everyone. This is the third lecture and the last one in the uh, first week. So we have been talking about computer components last time and now we're going to pick up with talking about some of the different classifications of computer programming languages and how you can actually interface your programming language with the uh, with the actual hardware on the computer. So let me go ahead and share my screen and get the slides going and you are invited to follow along either with me or by pulling up the slides for yourself. So let me do this and let's get this in full screen. So first we're going to talk about formal versus natural programming languages. Um, natural languages are the kinds of languages that we use to communicate every day. Um, for example, I'm speaking in the English language, which is a natural uh, communication language in the fields of neuropsychology, linguistics, and philosophy of language and natural or ordinary languages. Any language that emerged naturally in the human community was formed by a process of use, repetition, and change over time and may be spoken or a sign language. Um, there are a number of world languages, many of which undoubtedly you recognize. So English, Mandarin, Hindi, Spanish, French, um, modern Arabic, Russian, and Portuguese are just a few of the uh, examples of languages that we speak uh, currently in the world. Um, and so we're gonna contrast the natural languages that we use to speak and communicate with each other with the formal language. Formal languages are what we need to use to communicate with computers, not really uh, amongst human beings so much. Uh, it is a precisely defined set of rules and syntax. So I'm sure you've perhaps done some grammar and recognize that there are a number of irregular spellings in English. There's all kinds of irregularities that have come up because English language is not an exact language and it's the same in all spoken languages. There's all kinds of exceptions and so on. But in formal languages, that because they have been planned and developed in a very specific way, that, that sort of thing doesn't really exist. And so talking to computers, this is how we need to communicate. They're used to write computer programs. It provides a structured and standardized way of communication. Instructions are going to be translated into the machine code. We'll have more to say on that momentarily. Rules must be followed precisely for correct execution. So maybe I mess up and say something incorrect, and you can probably fill in what it is I meant to say. However, a computer doesn't have that ability to self-correct and so on, so you need to be extremely precise and you need to provide the exact instructions with the exact keywords, spelling, and so on that the machine expects. Human readable and, mach and, and machine executable uh, describes the formal language. Uh, it enables programmers to express complex complex tasks clearly, especially to their computers. So a number of examples of formal languages would be Python, Java, C++, JavaScript, and many more. It's vital in software development for creating various applications and systems. So we are going to work on learning the Python formal computing language. That brings us to the concept about levels of programming languages. Um, not all programming languages are the same and they don't all interact with the hardware on your computer in exactly the same way. So you're going to do a little bit of a comparison of these different things. So although simple, although they, are, they can be broadly classified into two different types. Um, although computer languages are simple compared to human languages, high level languages are more complex than low level languages. And what we mean by low level languages is getting down into actually working with the hardware on the computer, interfacing with the, the RAM, the CPU, um, the various components of the computer. A high level language is up closer to where the humans are at. Um, things that we can read and write and so on. Um, a low level language is going to be more in binary code because computers understand zeros and ones, whereas for us to interpret zeros and ones into words and sentences and ideas would be nearly impossible. So a high level language affords more readability in comparison to its low level counterpart, which needs specialist knowledge in computer architecture to interpret. So we're going to need to then have some way of going from the high level down to the low level. And that's part of what we're going to be taking a look at today. And there are some programming languages that inherently work at higher and lower levels. Um, 
so examples of high level programming languages include Java, Python, the various C languages, most of the computer languages that humans are going to be working with and actually writing their code in. Um, so you're not really going to be learning assembly or machine language. I mean, there are people who do learn this, but this is much more complicated and the, most of us are working at the high level and then um, interfacing with lower level um, kinds of programming languages such as the uh, assembly and, and machine code, um, which you might study if you go on to study computer science, but it's certainly quite possible to communicate and write programs for computers using high level computer programs. So let's just take a look at what the assembly language is. This is one of the lower levels. An assembly language contains a list of basic instructions. It's much harder to read than the high level language. It is just one level above the machine code in terms of abstraction. So it's still using words that humans can recognize. It's not in binary. Um, but these very simple codes are easily converted into the binary, which is the point of going into um, the assembly language so that we can then easily convert it over for the computers so that they can understand it. It can't be used to structure and manipulate complex information because it really just doesn't have that level of flexibility on any practical level. Um, the machine code then is the lowest level. Uh, it is directly understood by the computer's central processing unit or the a programmer will first write their code in a high level language such as Python, then the code is compiled into a machine readable format, and then instructions are represented in the binary in zero to one, which is the actual machine code. So that gives us the overview that there must be some way to go from what you write in Python, and then it's going to get converted and somehow then sent down into your computer's CPU to actually execute. And that's exactly what happens. So before we get into that, though, we need to talk a little bit about the design of programs. And I want to talk to you today about the algorithms, um, going from algorithms to programs. This ties into that idea about thinking like a computer scientist, which is one of the key things that we really want to learn in this class. Um, an algorithm is not necessarily a piece of code. Um, an algorithm is how to do something, uh, one of the activities that we'll talk about is you know, providing instructions for somebody to do something. How do you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? You see that that's not something that necessarily would involve a computer, although you could envision like a robot doing it. But what if you, what if I had never made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before and you needed to instruct me on how to make one? Um, you could provide some information about, you know, getting some slices of bread, some peanut butter and jelly, opening the jars, um, and, and the step-by-step -step instructions. Um, recipes are also a really great example of algorithms, how to do something. And so when we're thinking about problem solving, oftentimes what we need to do is we need to come up with an algorithm. What is the strategy on how we're going to solve this problem? And then we need to go from that algorithm into an actual piece of code that we could write in Python, for example. So, of course, maybe we think about this and we say, okay, so, you know, this is writing algorithms is hard and, and being precise in how we explain things and um, knowing that computers cannot interpolate information. So if I forget to say, and now pick up the knife in your hand to make your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, you can kind of put that information in that if I say, you know, use the knife to spread the peanut butter and jelly, that it requires you to actually pick it up. But computers are really very, very literal. And so it's hard, it's hard to think like that. And so uh, you might wonder, why should I even bother to program? Um, well, it will allow you to interact with computers on your own terms instead of relying on other people's programs. You can automate repetitive and or laborious tasks. If it weren't for computers, I would never get my simulations done. You can bring your ideas to life, and I hope you'll get a taste of this in your final projects. Um, computers can also do certain tasks much faster than humans, like running calculations. And you, why do you want to learn how to program? The reasons why you might want to are as various and sundry as the students who take these classes. So I'm gonna just put this up. Um, I know we haven't really talked about, but I want to give you the sense that 
This is not something that's impossible to learn. This is a snippet of code from a final project from a student that took the programming class some years ago. And the student is making a their own game. And uh, here we are going to the Monster Ball shop. Can we see deaf stop? Okay, so we have some sort of uh, some sort of a definition of something. We, we have encountered print before, so we get the idea that it's probably going to print some stuff out to the screen. Probably, welcome to Monster Ball shop. How can I help you? And now we get this idea of while true. Hmm, looping gives us that idea. And we see it will print out some money, and we are going to uh, get some input from the student, from the user, right? And we have a series of if statements. So we see that um, it's not entirely familiar, but you can get the idea that we're looking to see it, do they have enough money to buy the thing they want to buy? It looks like 30 is the critical amount. This is how much a monster ball cops costs at the monster ball shop. Uh, so we need to find out, do they, yes or no, do they have enough money? So we're going to use some if and else statements in order to decide about that information. Um, if they have typed one, we would uh, check to see if they have enough money. So if they wanted to buy a monster ball, and then also they could choose to leave the store. And so then we get a printout, uh, thank you for coming message here. Um, and then we also have um, some catch-all if they don't type something interpretable to deal with that. So you, I wouldn't expect you to understand everything that you're looking at here, but you could probably look at this and get some sense like, okay, I sort of know what's going on. And that's the great thing about Python and this kind of code. It is at a level that humans could look at this and you would have some hope of figuring out what's going on here. And as we work through the course, we're going to get an increasing level of understanding of how these things are actually working. So there are many, many programming languages that you could choose to learn. Uh, Java, Python, the various Cs, SQL for databases, Scala, COBOL, Fortran is a scientific one, um, and there's a whole bunch of them listed here. You've probably heard of some of these. Uh, Perl is another one, Ruby, uh, MATLAB. I actually teach a MATLAB class. Pascal is a pretty uh, different kind of a programming language. So there are many programming languages that you could learn how to use, and Python is just one of these. And that brings us to the distinction about another way we can divide programming languages. Uh, imperative programming language is the kind of programming that you probably usually think about that is giving specific commands to the computer step by step from start to finish on how to solve a certain task. Maybe you want to compute the total in the shopping cart. Maybe you want to buy a monster ball at a shop. You would see that there's a series of commands that needs to be provided and it is the job of the programmer write out those commands. And that is what we mean by imperative programming, telling the computer what to do. Then the computer dutifully carries out the commands. The order of the commands is very important. The programmer has to write the steps of the algorithm to solve the problem of interest. Imperative programming is probably the kind of programming that comes to mind when we talk about writing a program or a quote, regular uh, program. But that's not the only kind of programming. Um, so imperative is when you're telling the computer what to do and because we need to decide how to do it, then we're going to need to actually use an algorithm to do so. That is, um, figure out how we're going to tackle this test. How are we going to test whether or not the user has enough money to buy a monster ball at the shop? Uh, how are we going to get the total in a grocery cart? Our programming languages allow us to communicate algorithms to the computer, and so we're going to need to think about how we going to make the algorithm, and then we're going to need to go from that, those ideas of the algorithm who are actually programming up the computer. So these are some examples of programming languages that are imperative, including Python, the C's, the Fortran, Basic, MATLAB. You may have encountered some of these or at least heard of them. But there are other kinds of programming languages, such as declarative. Um, this tells the computer what you want to happen, and the computer figures out what to do. This kind of programming is not covered in our class. Now, you might think that that sounds really foreign, but think about on machine learning, this is exactly the kinds of things we do with machine learning when we say we wish for um, a computer to learn how to um, pick up a cup 
or we wish for a machine to learn how to um, how to uh, design a, a drug to to cure cancer. Um, we provide information about what we want to be done, and then the computer fills in the gaps and figures out how to actually do that through a learning process, similar to how the neurons in our brain work. And so that is a very interesting branch of computing, and we will not have the opportunity to cover that in this course, but you would be well on your way to be able to start learning how to do that after we finish. So we have this idea then for imperative programming where we are providing the steps for the computer to do um, to use algorithms to come up with some way of doing something and then actually coming up with code that matches to that algorithm. So I might ask you, you know, how do you draw a square? And so this is the instructions, move forward 100 pixels, turn clockwise by 90 degrees and repeat this four, four times. And hopefully you can see that that would draw a square. And here we have a Python turtle canvas. So this is one of the graphics programs. We will visit this in the semester and the turtle can, which is this little arrow that traces out these lines, would be able to actually follow this. And so here I'm showing you the corresponding code on how to do this. Now, don't panic, I don't expect you know how to do the code, but I think again, you can get the gist of what I'm trying to say here. We're going to import the turtles to draw the pictures and then we're going to repeat something four times, which is why we do for i in range four. So we will, do the turtle forward 100 times, that means walk forward for 100 pixels and then turn right by 90 degrees. And because we're doing this four times, then we are going to, in fact, actually draw the square. Now we could actually draw this out in a diagram as well. Notice that we need to have a start and a stop state because we always need to have a way to start and stop. And we would put the turtle's pen down, which I've omitted for simplicity in our code, but we could put the turtle's pen down, we would begin the count at some number, and then we would move forward 100 steps, turn clockwise by 90 degrees, increment your count by one, and then we ask the question, is our count up to four yet, yes or no? And if, uh, if yes, then we would stop, and if no, we would um, move forward again. So some of the things that are illustrated here are implicitly inside of this for loop, which we will visit in more detail in a couple of weeks, but it gives you the sense of how we can draw this picture using a diagram. We can also write the code for that, and we could also say the same idea in just plain English um, that everybody could understand, and we're going to need to then be able to move, especially between the ideas and writing the Python code to represent those ideas. So we can trace through the code. We've kind of just done this a little bit. So we would we would start off with i being equal to one, and then we would go the turtle dot forward 100, and then we proceed to the next line to do the turtle right. And because it's a for loop, we go back up to the top, and i automatically increments up to two. And then we do the turtle forward 100 and turn right again, and then i equals three, repeat back to the top and i equals four. And then when we get to the bottom of that and we go up here and we ask is i within the range of one to four, we say no, we've now exceeded it because it's now equal to five, so it's out of range. And so then this uh, terminates and that is how we can write some code using a for loop to make a square. And we can also follow this through in the pseudocode so we can be uh, stepping through this diagram also, and this matches up to what's going on. The, um, the star depend down, account equals zero, and so on. Um, it can be useful to diagram these things out and just make this little chart because it helps you to get the sense of what kinds of things need to go um, step by step. So here's our trace through over here, and it gives us this idea of what the actual code needs to be in order for this to actually work. Now, we also have this idea of parsing. Now, parsing is something that you may have encountered in your algebra class and done maybe without actually calling it this. Um, parsing may also be referred to as syntax analysis or syntactic analysis. It's the process of analyzing a string of symbols such as words or 
code, either in natural language or computer languages or data structures and conforming to the rules of a formal grammar. The term of parsing comes from the Latin pars, meaning to put into parts. And this is the definition provided by Wikipedia. So to parse in computer sciences, where a string of commands, usually a program, is separated into the more easily digestible process components, which are analyzed for the correct syntax and then attached to tags that define each component. The computer can then process each program chunk and transform it into the machine language. And so because we have this idea of figuring out like from what information is given, how do we convert this into the actual machine code? We're going to need to make sure that the input is in a very specific way, which is why we're going to be using those. Um, we're not going to be using the natural language, but we'll be working with machine languages instead. So you've probably done the parsing of syntax I was alluding to. Um, so syntax expresses the, uh, some kind of an idea and the parsing is the extracting of the meaning of the idea. Here's another definition for you, um, uh, well, for the syntax. Um, it is the arrangement of words and phrases to create a well-formed sentences in a language, such as the syntax of the English language. We have a subject, verb, direct object kinds of patterns and sentences. Um, there are ways that we need to speak and the order of words. Otherwise, it would just be a jumble of words and that wouldn't make any sense and nobody would understand what it means. And so there have to be some kind of rules of analysis of the syntax of a language. Um, this is, there are all these kinds of branches of, of studies that people do in order to understand how languages have evolved. And if you've done any studying of a foreign language, you would get some flavor of what other kinds of syntaxes there might be. So from math, we do parsing syntax all the time. And you've probably heard about the order of operations, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division from left to right, whichever comes first, and then addition and subtraction from left to right. And so we need to then parse um, an expression. So we might provide you with uh, this kind of an expression in your math class, one plus two times three. And so if there were no parsing rules, one might proceed by first adding the one plus two. But of course, I'm sure you remember that multiplication and division comes first. So we would need to first do the two times three. And this gives us the idea that the order that we need to proceed in is governed by some rules about the order of operations, some kind of precedence in terms of how we're going to proceed with this. And so we would then infer that this is the meaning of what it is. And so this is what we need to parse this expression. We need to do these things first. This is the meaning of this expression is that these two items need to be multiplied before we do the addition. As I'm sure you remember from algebra, if you don't follow the rules of, oper of order of operations, you can compute the wrong answer and that's not gonna work. So we have to follow parsing and Python parses in a very similar way to how we parse things using order of operations. So then the final thing I wanna to talk to you about is the program execution. Um, the first thing that needs to happen is the programmer, that's you, needs to write some code. Um, so you're going to need to actually go into your Python uh, idle editor and to actually write some code. It's a series of human readable instructions written in the Python programming language. For example, you could of course write it in another language. When the Python program is ready to run. It's saved in a file with the .py extension. So you might say my program .py. You're going to do file save as and save it up, and then we're going to run it. And if my slides will change, we can go to the next one. The next thing that we need to do is we need to um, have the interpreter. The interpreter converts the programmer's code into the machine code. So we're going from the source code that you, as a programmer, wrote into the byte code. So this is a .pyc file. The Python interpreter, which is a program installed on the computer, reads the Python code from the py file. The Python interpreter processes the code line by line and converts it into a lower level representation called the byte code. It's a set of instructions that can be easily executed by the Python virtual machine, which we'll get to in a sec. And the Python virtual machine, this is an interpreter for Python's bytecode is going to be able to understand 
and the bytecode, and then it is responsible for executing the bytecode on the program, uh, the computer's hardware. So this is going to interface with the CPU, for example. During execution, the PVM interacts with the computer's operating system to perform the tasks, such as input and output operations and memory management, moving things in and out of the RAM, uh, looking up information, data, um, inputs, variable values, and so on. The PPM translates the bytecode into machine code specific to the computer's processor architecture, making it understandable by the computer's CPU, which is ultimately what actually carries it out. Finally, the computer's central processing unit will actually execute the code. The CPU executes the machine code following the instructions provided by the Python code, so the zeros and ones of the bytecode that it receives is a copy of what the intended meaning was, or hopefully the intended meaning of the programmer from uh, what was actually written in the Python file. As the CPU executes the machine code, the Python program performs the desired operations, calculations, and tasks defined in the original code. The output, if any, is displayed on the screen, stored in files, or used in um, as needed basis on the program's instruction. So we have here then our hello world program that we have seen before. So we print hello world. This is what you wrote as the programmer. And when we run it, we see that the result is something gets displayed on the screen. And that is how we go from your original code to the information that is actually displayed on the screen. The computer central processing unit or CPU executes the machine code following the instructions as it executes. Python program performs the desired operations, calculations, and tasks in the original code. The output, of any, is on the screen. And when the program completes, the Python interpreter and the PVM release the system resources and terminate the program. And this is why you can run multiple programs. You can also run a program multiple times. The process of going from Python code to running a program is repeated each time the Python program is executed, ensuring that the instructions are carried out correctly. The cycle of interpreting and executing Python allows programmers to create a wide range of applications from simple scripts to complex software, which makes Python very versatile and a widely used programming language. All right, so that concludes our first week of lectures. We have had an overview of the course, how to get started with Python. We looked at working interactively with scripts, um, interactively versus the, the scripts. We've also looked at um, the computer hardware, main, major components. We looked at formal versus natural languages. We've looked at levels of programming, high versus low. And we have talked about going from algorithms, those ideas into actual making programs. And finally, we have talked about the way that a program actually executes. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I hope you have found this to be useful for you and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.